All right. So we'll get initiated into uh, rudiments of uh, vector algebra today. So it's all based on the premise that uh, nature has three kinds of physical entities to offer. Uh, those that we have already dealt with in great detail, scalars, that don't require more than a number for their complete specification. That number can come married with a sign. Most of the quantities that you have dealt with till this point of time are scalars and their complete specification occurs with the help of a number that could come with a sign, a plus sign or a minus sign. And now we will uh, dig into the domain of what we refer to as vectors. Um, another variety, another breed of uh, entities uh, offered by nature whose complete specification occurs with the help of two things, a magnitude, a number associated with those things and direction. There are two things and these quantities as you are already aware of, these are vectors. And then there is a third kind of entity with which you would remain, uh, of which you will remain oblivious for a while uh, till such time that you get into an engineering college and choose to become a mechanical or an aeronautical engineer. Uh, that's, th those quantities are called tensors. But then you don't have to know about the algebra of tensors. We would focus uh, strictly on the algebra related to vectors. Now, first of all, the designation. After all, every time you start studying something systematically, you want to know how it gets designated or represented, right? There is an algebraic representation and there is a geometric representation, right? As far as the geometric representation of these quantities called vectors is concerned, it's with the help of line segments with the help of an arrowhead. Line segments with an arrowhead will measure a vector completely geometrically. The arrowhead will tell you the direction of the vector and the length of the line segment will be a measure of the magnitude of the vector. So this, for example, is a vector A with this as its direction and this length being a measure of the magnitude of the vector A. This length being a measure of the magnitude of the vector A. And magnitude of the vector A, which means this length is designated by mod A. Mod A means the magnitude of A, which is proportional to this length. If then someone talks of a vector which is 2 times A, in verbose, the statement means that it's a vector which is twice as large as A, but having a direction synonymous with A. The direction of A and the direction of 2A is the same. However, the magnitude of 2A is twice the magnitude of A. So then, uh, the geometric, if this is the geometric representation of A, then the geometric representation of 2A would be a vector parallel to A, would be a vector parallel to A, but twice as large as A. But the line segment representing 2A would be twice as large as the line segment representing A. Now, if there is a vector which is represented as minus A. Now, minus A is again a vector which is same in as far as the magnitude is concerned as A. However, its direction is opposite to the direction of A. Which means if this is A, then this vector is going to be minus A. Both A and minus A are represented by line segments of the same length. However, their arrowheads would be oppositely directed. Clear? In general, in general, if k is a positive number, in general, if k is a positive number, which I would, whenever I talk of numbers, I'll Say, well, if k is a scalar, for example, a positive scalar. So, if k is a scalar, a positive scalar, let's say, and if I have a vector a, then the vector k times a in general would be a vector k times as large as a and having a direction same as a. 
This would be a vector k times a. Obviously, if k is less than 1, then the vector k times a would be less than the vector a. If k is greater than 1, then this would be a vector larger in magnitude compared to a. Hmm. Now, another important proposition of vectors is the fact that if there is a vector a whose magnitude is represented by this length and whose direction is given by this arrowhead, then again amongst vectors, there are two varieties of vectors. There are two varieties of vectors. One in which, for example, this vector I say is a vector acting at the point P and of this length, of this magnitude. It's a vector, this I say is a vector acting at the point P. For example, it could be a force acting at the point P whose magnitude is this. Now, in vectors, once again, there are two varieties. One, in which I could move a vector parallel to itself without altering the effect that it produces. For example, if this is a vector, then it could be a vector, for example, which could be moved parallel to itself and the effect produced by this vector on a body or this vector on a body is going to be the same. If I move a vector parallel to itself, in this case, this is a vector in which it does not matter whether this vector is acting at P or it is acting at Q. As long as their directions are the same, their magnitudes are the same, these vectors would be looked upon as identical vectors because they produce the same effect, same effect. However, there would be vectors, there would be vectors in which the point of application would be important too. There would be vectors in which the point of application would be important too. For example, you know, if let's say this is a door and I apply a force at this end, force is a vector quantity, I apply a force at this end, then it produces a certain turning effect. However, if I come closer to the hinge, and I apply a force closer to the hinge, the turning effect that this force produces would be lesser, right? So, in this case, this vector, although force is a vector which could be moved parallel to itself, but in, a, in an application of this kind, it matters where that force is applied. It matters where that force is applied because this force when applied here, 5 Newton force, it will produce one kind of turning effect. When I apply a 5 Newton force closer to the hinge, it will have a lesser propensity to turn. When I apply the force exactly at the hinge, it is not going to turn the door at all, right? So, the same force when applied at different points is going to produce different turning effects. So, the same force based on the effect that we are representing or communicating, based on that, uh, the point of application may or may not be important, right? So, so until and unless stipulated very categorically, we will assume this, that the vector could be moved parallel to itself. By and large, by and large, if nothing special is attributed, we will assume that the vector could be moved parallel to itself and it is the effect that it is going to produce by this parallel movement will not change, right? Now. We could have two vectors A and 3A, for example. These are parallel vectors, right? These are parallel vectors, and this combination, for example, could be replaced by one single vector, which is 4A, which is 4A. If these are two parallel vectors, then I simply add their magnitudes to get the magnitude of a vector which would be called their resultant or their equivalent. That means these two vectors could be replaced by one single vector which is four times as large as A and having a magnitude same as that of the two constituent parallel vectors, right? That means if two vectors are parallel, then 
we deal with them almost like scalars in the sense their algebra is like scalars because the effect of a and 3a is obtained by simply adding 1 and 3 to get a 4a to get a 4a right i could have had let's say a vector 5a like this and this let's say is a vector minus 2a minus 2a is a vector two times as large as a but opposite to a opposite to a so then the net effect of these two vectors would be a single vector which would be three times a so if vectors are parallel then their algebra is almost like the algebra of scalars right to find their equivalent uh, it suffices to know how you dealt with numbers or scalars right However, if two vectors are not parallel, if two vectors are not parallel, 